our dear viewers and listeners. We greet you all in the wonderful and precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Again we say today is the day the Lord has made. And we shall rejoice and be glad. Welcome to today's Bible study. And as you invite somebody to join you for what the Lord has for you today. Let's begin this session with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Yes, Lord. Our Lord and our Savior, mm. our God and King. Yes, Lord. We yield to your greatness, yes, Lord. to your authority, mm. to the Lordship of your word, yes, Lord. the unadulterated word of God. Yes, Lord. We yield to it, King of God. Yes, Lord. Have your way. Mm. Give us the grace to speak your word yes, Lord. as it ought to be spoken. Mm. For you follow your word to perform it. Yes, Lord. We thank you, Spirit of the Living God, mm. for such a wonderful moment. Mm. We thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 When we talk about life, everybody has their perception of what a perfect life would be depending on what they have gone through depending on their imagination depending on what they have been trained to think depending on what their dreams are depending on so many other factors of life so we ask ourselves what is a perfect life like and on this side of time the truth of the matter is we cannot experience life in its perfection. However, that's not the end of the story. Like we will see in today's text, on the other side of time, we will experience life. Life in its perfection. As the scriptures reveal it to us. We saw the picture last week of the new Jerusalem which will be our destiny which will be our final place where God dwells in the midst of his people and it is here that we will experience life in its perfection let's see what the scriptures have for us today. we will take the reading from the book of Revelation. Chapter 22, which is the final chapter of the Bible. We shall be reading from verse 1 to verse 5. And this is what the Bible describes. John is still on the tour. The tour of the bride of the Lamb, who is God's people, with God dwelling in their midst, now revealed in glory, now revealed in majesty, now revealed in splendor. Here the Bible says, and he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street, and on either side of the river, was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of nations. And there was, there shall be no more curse. 
but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. And his servants shall serve him. Then shall see his face. And his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp. No light of the sun. For the Lord God gives them light. And they shall reign forever. And ever. What a wonderful text that yeah, we have that gives us the glimpse of a perfect life. And in these first five verses of this final chapter, four objects come forth from the verses that we just read. The first one is the river of the water of life. The second one is the street of the city. The third is the tree of life. And the fourth is the throne of God and of the Lamb. Each of these relates in some fashion to God who is the source of life. So let's look at the first one which is the river of life or the river of the water of life. The angel that was with John had come to him to show him this new Jerusalem. And now he is leading him to see the river of life. Now I must point out to you that we are still on the journey Last week, John showed us what is not in the city. Now he tells us what is there that he did not expect to be there. And what he sees is the river of the water of life. John records for us the source of this river. He says it is flowing from God, the throne of God and of the Lamb. And he describes the water of this river as the water of life that is as clear as crystal. You see, just like everything we saw from the beginning concerning the city that comes down. Everything reflects the glory of God. The crystal clear water speaks of his holiness. It speaks of his power. We all know that water that flows. For those of you that know about hydroelectric power, we draw hydroelectric power from flowing water. Water that flows is a source of power. Its clearness speaks to purity. And this is a symbol of life eternal. Basically, it is the symbol of the indwelling spirit that comes, flows from the throne of God. Let me explain this further. The first time our Lord Jesus Christ talks about the flowing water was in the 
gospel according to John chapter 4. When on the journey he decides to trek through Samaria and gets to this town of Saika where by the well he sits down and sends his disciples to the town to buy food. And there he encounters the woman of Samaria. And their discourse takes a turn when he asks this woman for water. And the woman asks, you a Jew asking me a Samaritan for water? Jesus answers in verse 10. He asks, tells her, if you knew the gift of God and who is it that says to you, give me a drink? You would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. And the woman said, sir, <laughs> you have nothing to draw the water. And this well is deep. So where do you get living water? You are no greater than our father Jacob who gave us the world to drink and drank from it himself and his sons and his cattle. And Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But he goes on to say, whoever drinks of the water which I give him, whoever drinks of the water that I give him shall never thirst. But the water that I give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. The water that Jesus gives comes a well that springs brings unto eternal life. A well that flows from the inside of whoever has received from the Lord. Listen to what we just saw. In the book of Revelation 22, John says in this city, a river containing water that flows from the throne of God and the Lamb, the Lamb who is Christ, and now flows to the city. This is fulfillment of the promise Jesus made to this woman in John chapter 4 from verse 10 to verse 14. That was not the first time Jesus talks about water flowing. In John chapter 7 on the feast of tabernacles a feast where that took one entire week. And every day, the priest would get a golden pitcher from the temple. Slop down from the temple to the pool of Siloam where he would draw the water. And the procession goes back to the temple. Basically as they are going, when they get there to the courtyard of the temple, the priest would then quote Isaiah chapter 12 and verse 3, which says that with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And as he pours this water, there is silence. And then every 
everybody would rapture in praise. Because God has promised that with joy we will draw water from the wells of salvation. And as everyone watches this happening, there is silence as water is poured out. Then which develops into a rapture of praise. Come the last day as they are doing this. So why are they involved in this ceremony? They are commemorating the 40 years on their journey from Egypt to the land of promise. And on this journey, there was a rock that followed them. It is the rock that Moses struck. And when he struck the rock, water came from this rock and provided for them for 40 years. So that none of them ever had thirst anymore. This is how Paul paints the picture. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4, he declares that all drank of the spiritual drink. For they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. Now they are commemorating this journey. And Jesus himself is in their midst. On the seventh day of this Feast of Tabernacles, the Bible tells us that as they kept quiet, Jesus raises his voice. He stood up Ideally, a priest would sit down before they spoke. Now he stood up. This was very important. For he has come to the temple before. Luke chapter 4, when the scroll was given to him, he sat down and read. That was the practice. Now he stands up and in the loud voice cries out and says if anyone is thirsty let him come to me and drink. And he says, he who believes in me, as the scripture says, from his innermost being will flow the rivers of living water. The flow comes because we believe in Jesus Christ. That is John chapter 7. 37 to 39. What is Jesus painting here? He's giving us the picture that the rock which the Israelites fed from was a type now he is the antitype of that rock. In other words, the rock was a picture of him. That as the rock was smitten for the people to drink, he will be smitten so that we may be able to drink. And he tells them before he goes. He says, I must go. For if I don't go, then he won't come. The journey had to involve him being smited. And because he was smited, then the flow 
from Calvary cleanses us of all our sins. And not only that, then the Spirit of God comes to make his home in our lives. And out of our innermost being then flows the river of the water of life that he promises. So what he promises now that John sees is what he has seen before in Revelation 21 and verse 6. This is what the Bible says. He says that the one seated on the throne says, I will give water as a gift to the thirsty from the springs of life. The only currency that you need to draw is a thirst. How thirsty are you? Because that is the currency we use to draw from him. You see, concerning the kingdom and where we are, you can choose one of two. You can choose to be a participant. Or you can choose to be a spectator. You see, for many people that watch sports, for example, football, you have 22 people on the field. And the 22 people are the participants. Then the thousands of people watching, those are the spectators. Do you know what? What again? The reward doesn't go to the spectators. The reward goes to the participants. We may be 10,000 or maybe 40,000. But the reward comes to those that are active. Even concerning the kingdom. The reward comes to those that participate, not to those that spectate. So the call to you is to get out of the stands. Stop analyzing. Stop the criticism. Get into the race. Become a participant for the kingdom. And the reward will come to you. That is what God promises. The river that we see here calls us back to the book of Genesis. You see, I told you that the book of Revelation draws us back to the very beginning. We saw a river in the garden of Eden. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 10. And we see as the picture progresses, we continue to see water flowing from the temple from the presence of God. Ezekiel 47. From 1 to 12. We see water drawing from the altar. From the Holy of Holies. Coming out of the temple. And Ezekiel gives us the cycles as it feeds to the knee. To the waist. Until he is forced to swim in that water. Until he is caused to swim in that flow. Joel. Chapter 4 verse 18. Zechariah chapter 14 verse 8 also prophetically speak. But what they are drawing us to is the consummation that we see now in the book of Revelation. I know a lot of people have said a lot of things concerning the symbolism around the water that flows from the throne of God. Although they are valuable insights, the one that holds true, that 
pertains to the intended fullness of what John saw in the vision. Here we have a river flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And this river is the third person of the Trinity of the Godhead who is the Holy Spirit the one who authors the word of life the one who regenerates the spirit of unbelievers who grants us the faith to trust in Jesus Remember Jesus said he will take of what is mine and give it to you. He is the one who grants us the faith to trust in Jesus. He is the one who indwells us. He seals us for the day of redemption. He baptizes us with the spirit. He guides, he guides us and then ensures us, that we grow to full maturity and attain the glory of the resurrection which we now see being perfected in the bride that has come down with the river flowing through the city. Hope you understand what we mean by that. Let's go to the next one. The second object that we see which is often missed is the street. Now, the street that is talked about is a street in the middle of the city. John notes and he gives us the account that the river flows from the throne and flows in the middle of the street. That is verse 2. And what is he talking about? Remember he said the street was of pure gold that is transparent. Now this is a public meeting place that has a river flowing through it. And when you look at the words that are used here, it is an amazing thing because it points to like a public square. We have met this before in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 6. This is what the Bible calls the glassy sea or the sea of of crystal glass. You have a street of gold. You have the water flowing that is as clear as crystal. And this place of assembly is where John saw in chapter 4 the thousands flowing down before the throne in worship. Now, what is happening here? <coughs> I need to show you a few things concerning this street that points to its significance. First of all, the people that John sees in Revelation chapter 4, these are men and women that come out of the persecution. They are persecuted for the worship of the Lamb. So their whole understanding and their life, they have never experienced worship without persecution. Now in this life, they are before the throne with the with the spirit of the Lord flowing to them. And what is happening there in an atmosphere of worship? Worship that is unhindered. Worshiping the Lord on the throne. And worshiping the Lamb that is seated on the throne. The second thing I want us to see here is that they are in a place in the presence of the the Godhead. 
There is no fear. There is no shame. The past has been forgiven. They don't want, they don't need anything to drink. They don't need anything to eat. <laughs> they can't dread the night because God gives them light. Here they are in the perfect atmosphere. I want you to see the third thing. You see, the city of Rome at the time John was writing was known for paved cities as a way of driving cameras. So they were paved with stone. Now we see a city paved with gold. And why gold? To point us to the value. They are pointing us to an atmosphere not of driving commerce but of enthralling worship. Here the believers, here those that are redeemed by the blood gather to worship the Lamb. Look at the gold and I want you to see something here. Gold that is as transparent as Glass. And what we see bewilders our widest thoughts. Because where we are on this side of time, we get hold gold and hold it away. Because it is valuable. We keep it. On the other side of time, gold is walked on. It is not to be hoarded. It is a public utility. It is something that is stepped on. The value is lost on the other side of time. That calls for us to evaluate what our priorities are. Because it could be possible possible that what you are holding on this side of time has no value in the next life. I want you to see the third thing. How you access these streets. The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 7 verse 13 to 14 Jesus says enter and he's talking about the kingdom of heaven. And he says through the narrow gate. Jesus says concerning the street or concerning the kingdom of heaven. He says enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And there be many who go through it. And he says, however narrow is the gate and the difficult the road that leads to life. And there be few that find it. I need you to see something here. When it concerning the broad road, he does not say there will be many that find it. Why? Because you are already on it. You are already on the broad road leading to destruction. What you need to do is to find the narrow road that leads to eternal life. And it is that narrow road that leads you to the narrow gate. And Jesus mentions in John chapter 14 and verse 6 and says, I am the way. Basically, he is the narrow way. You are on the broad way that leads to destruction. So we need to find Jesus who is the narrow way. And go through him who is the narrow gate which then leads us to the broad street on the other side of eternity. 
So on this side, it is the narrow way. On the other side, you will have the broad street. On the other hand, on this side, if you are on the way of destruction, you are on the broad way. You need to find the narrow way. So how do you get to that street? Through the narrow way. Through the narrow gate. Who is Jesus Christ? Let's look at the third one. Which is the tree of life. The first time we hear of the tree of life. Is in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 9. It is one of the trees in the middle of the garden. In the garden we had two trees. Those the tree of life which man was permitted to eat the fruit thereof. And there was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil which he was not permitted to eat the fruit thereof. And in disobedience he ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And as a result of that the sin nature became his. So God had to drive him out of the garden of Eden so that he does not eat of the tree of life and live perpetually in his fallen state. That is the grace of God. So in Genesis chapter 3 verse 24 we see man chased out of the garden and access denied to him. But I want you to see what is happening here. Through Christ Jesus who comes as the last Adam. We are then recreated and then restored to the position of the beginning. So when we leave this planet, we cross over to the very beginning where the Bible quotes that there shall be no curse of sin because the curse of sin has been taken away. How does this happen? Look at what happens. Man sinned by eating the fruit of a tree. The curse of man was taken away. When the last Adam through obedience hung on the tree and became a curse for us that we then become the righteousness of God through him. Through the tree the curse came. Through the tree at Calvary the curse was done away with. And now we receive the blessing of God. We receive the restoration of what God had intended for mankind in the first place. Oh, we thank God for Calvary. That is why when you come to Christ, the curse of sin is broken over your life. Let me say that again. When you come to Jesus Christ in faith, believing what he has done for you, the curse of sin is broken over your life. The Bible says, cast is anyone that hangs on the tree. And because he hung on the tree, he became a curse for us. That we become the righteousness of God. Now the Bible tells us that here, we see the tree of life. And it is not just a tree of life. What was one tree? 
Now the Bible says Bible the tree of life on either side of the river. So we have like an arcade with trees of life on either side. What a wonderful sight this is. And man is permitted to eat of this tree of life. For the tree, the Bible says, bears fruit every month. Now I must point out that in the other side of eternity, we are not in the side of time. So why does the Bible use man? Basically to tell us that the fruit will come unendingly. So there will be fruit all the time. And so John on the side of time tries to describe that. And tells us why in this side of time. Because we know that fruit comes in months. He says fruit will come every month. Basically to tell you that there will be fruit all the time. This is what Jesus promises the church in Ephesus. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 7, look at what he says. He says, I give the victor to the, that is the redeemer. Those that participated in the faith. Because victors are participants. Victors are not spectators. He says, I will give the victor the right to eat of, from the tree of life, which is in God's paradise. And this is what we see as the culmination of all this. Now somebody has asked, will we eat? Will we be eating in our glorified state? Yes, we will. But not because we are hungry. I give you examples in scripture that people in the glorified state did it all the way from Genesis 18. You remember the visitor to Abraham and Sarah. When the Lord visited Abraham and Sarah, he ate of Sarah's cakes. And he also ate the calf that Abraham killed and dressed and prepared. The Bible also tells us, Matthew chapter 26, Jesus at the Last Supper, he tells the disciples, that I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the day when I come into my father's kingdom. And then after his resurrection, John chapter 20, Luke chapter 24, we see him sit down and eat. Revelation chapter 19, we have the feast, marriage feast of the Lamb. Even there we see eating. But this eating is not a result of hunger. This eating is a result of celebration. Praise be to God. Now I want to draw off the fruit and bring it to you. This fruit represents to us the evidence of the glory of God. And I would draw this to what happened in the tabernacle. There was a table and on this table was the showbread. And this showbread was a present 
reality was something that was always present before God. So the tree of life represents what the shop bread represented in the temple. It represented God's presence. It represented God as the provider for all these people throughout all ages. And the leaves the Bible talks about. Now this doesn't, remember the people are not sick. So why are the leaves the healing of the nations? This, the leaves are a reminder that God is the supplier of eternal life. So they tell us about the health that is provided by God. You see, if you are into agriculture, they tell the health of a plant by two things. By the look of the leaves and by the look of the fruit. So the leaves and the fruit will tell us whether the plant is healthy or not. So when you have healthy fruit and healthy leaves, they point to a healthy tree. So what we see here are leaves that bring life, wholeness. And fruit that brings wholeness. Which points to the fruit of the spirit which points to the healing that has the wholeness that comes because of the presence of God in the midst of his people. Let's look at number four. Number four points to the throne of God and of the Lamb. Twice in these first verses, John tells us of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In verse 1, he tells us that the river of the water of life flows from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And again, he talks about the city. And he says, this is located in the midst of the city. So we see in verse 3 and verse 1, pointing us back to the throne. Why the throne? Because this is the central place. This is the source of the life that we now see. This is the source of the growth that now radiates throughout. Everything draws from what is coming from the throne. We see the trinity of the Godhead and it is from him that everything draws life. It is from them that everything draws vitality. It is from them that everything exists. You see, concerning the throne, this was the place where we saw judgment happen. Concerning the throne, this is where we saw worship happen. Concerning the throne, this is where we saw a judgment being passed on the devil. In Revelation chapter 20, and now we see two thrones of the Lord, the Lord God, Almighty, and the Lamb. Now, I know some critics have said that God is spirit. So, why would a spirit get a physical throne? But hold a minute. Let's go back. There is something we are overlooking. We overlook the fact that the word became flesh and did manifest himself to us. When 
Isaiah saw in the table. Isaiah we alaba muyeka. He saw a throne. Alaba namulundo in the temple. And the glory of God filled this whole temple. So it is not far-fetched that God can choose to manifest his glory from a throne and that be made visible to those that are in the city. Praise be to God. Now I want you to see something here. Because we have seen the many people gathering before the throne. What does this represent? It represents the sovereignty of God over all his creation. The message that we have is that God is in control. Is always just as his words and deeds are whatever he has promised he is going to fulfill and we his believers we that have believed in the Lord Jesus will serve him we will reign with him as he sits on his throne in glory throughout all eternity now John sees the servants of God around the throne and these servants see his face. They serve him in the unending light of his presence. Now he says that on their foreheads they bore the Lord's name. Now this doesn't mean that God will brand everyone like people brand that's not what he's trying to say. There are two truths that are signified here. One, that God knows his people. And he has marked them by his Holy Spirit. And so whoever has his spirit now belongs to him. So they know God and they joyfully keep him forever at the front of their mind. So he takes the first place of preeminence in their life. The knowledge of him supersedes the knowledge of anything else. So that is the picture that I want us to see. This is the glory that was denied of Moses. When in Exodus 33 he asked to see the glory of God. And God said, no, no one can see my face and live. And he said, but there is a rock beside me. And he hid him in the rock. And he put, when he had passed, he removed his hand and Moses saw his back. I believe that rock was Christ. And in Christ he was able to see the glory of God. But now in this new Jerusalem, we see him face to face. His glory permeates everything around this place. God's clarity now gives direction to everyone that is in this city. So we participate in dominion with him forever. Back to the very beginning. Genesis 1, 27. 26-27 where he says, let's make man in our image after our likeness. In spite of everything the devil did, God will restore everything and bring man back to the place of dominion. Dominion with him. 
in the new earth that he has created forever and ever. So God's plan can be delayed. But God's plan for your life cannot be thwarted. Delay does not mean denial. Whatever God has promised, he will bring to pass. So let's put this picture into perspective for us of how this will all pan out. We will be in perfect communion with God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit reflected as the throne of God and of the Lamb with the Holy Spirit reflected as the water drawing from the throne of God and the Lamb flowing into this city which we saw as a cube representing the presence of God. And I told you that the presence of God draws us back to the temple and the cube was the Holy of Holies where God's presence did abide with no physical light. And in the same way here, there will be no physical light. Because God will be our light. The, he will be our temple. He will be our life. He will be our joy. He will be our peace. And he will be our contentment. We will know him as he knows us. We will worship him. We will serve him. We will delight in him. We will honor him. We will receive his love. We will receive his provision. He will delight in us. And his glory shall be poured lavishly upon us. To me, that is the perfect picture. Where we will not be in just communion with God, but we will be in perfect communion with the community around us, with no fighting amongst us, with no jealousy, no critical spirit, no competition, no unforgiveness, no anger, no fear, no resentment, no pride, no contempt. We will be like an orchard bearing fruit. Like the tree of life on either side of the river. Bearing fruit in season and out of season. Our lives will be bearing the the life of the spirit. Sorry. Sorry. Our lives will be bearing the fruit of the spirit in season and out of season. Love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control will abound. That is the perfect life. How? Why? Because God will be in the midst of his people. We will draw from his image. We will draw from his likeness. We will radiate his glory. We will radiate his majesty. So where does that put you? Will you be part of this? If not, this is how you get there. You go through the narrow way. Who is Jesus Christ? We all begin on the broad way. The way that brings us to destruction. But we need to find the narrow way. And today, if you have never received Jesus in your life as your personal Lord and Savior, 
The narrow way is Jesus. Why don't you say this prayer with me? And get onto the narrow way. That takes you onto the narrow gate. That places you into this street. Where you will enjoy the presence of God for all eternity. Jesus is the only way. So why don't you say this prayer with me? Say God in heaven. Creator of the universe, I thank you because you care for sinners and I am one of them. Today, Lord, I agree that I need a Savior in my life. And Jesus is that Savior. I believe, Lord Jesus, that you came into this world, paid the ransom for sin, and I receive the forgiveness that you give through your shed blood. Lord, may my name be written in the book of life. Thank you for saving me. Thank you, Lord. Fill me with your spirit. May it flow. May he guide. May he strengthen. May he cover. May he encourage me every step of the way until I come before the throne. Lord of grace and mercy, I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you say this prayer from the bottom of your heart, you are forgiven. The blood of Jesus cleanses you of every sin. The curse is broken over your life. The Spirit of God now floods your heart. Now fills every void. Cleanses you of every guilt. Gives you a new perspective in life. You embark now on a journey that leads you to eternal blessedness. There is the number on the screen. Please call it. Somebody on the other side will receive and provide you the guidance of the first steps on this wonderful journey. From Dominion Church, we are blessed to have you. And until next week, we are saying God richly bless you. Shalom.